the most. I was, I was after that 2012 movie that I loved. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, um, well, it's a smaller group. That, that's okay. I like it because actually this is one of those things that I'm kind of like, I'm a little bit embarrassed, and not necessarily embarrassed, but it's, it's difficult to breach this topic with a lot of the kind of people at these events because one of the, the, the topic was drink or cool it, right? Yeah, right? And of course, you know, that has to do with, you know, Jonestown, right? <laughs> yeah, Jim and, Jones. Yeah, Jim Jones. Uh -huh. The concept of it is that, like, you know, even though those people in Jonestown knew, you know, after a certain point, yeah, they're going to die by drinking this Kool Aid. You know, most of them uncoerced, a lot of them were coerced, but most of them uncoerced, they did anyway. You know, they basically were the lemmings that walked up the cliff and just had faith and belief, right? They had faith and belief totally that what they were doing, you know, that what Jim Jones was into, what he was representing was more important than their life, was more important than anything. Um, now, I bring this up because a lot of the energy we spend in these kind of events and these kind of, you know, um, like any kind of group of space nerds will immediately start, well, how do we sell space, right? Like, how do we sell space? Like, you know, and, and they start to approach it in a very rational, you know, modern way in which you're trying to figure out what is the best way to actually represent this in, in a package that is consumable. Like, you know, is it profitable? You know, can we represent it saying, oh, you know, it, it, it's insured security? You know, by you know, like preventing us from being killed by asteroids, meteors, asteroids, whatever. You know, does it, uh, you know, provide an economic incentive? Can you make money in it? But they're missing kind of one of the main kind of key motivators of humanity, which is neither of these things. It is not the practical that really motivates people to do great things or even ridiculous things. It is totally impractical and ridiculous. It is belief and faith that really moves mountains. That really makes people do things. You know, that is beyond. Um, beyond, beyond any okay, Edmund Hillary or you know, uh, God, who, who's, a, who's a fellow on a, um, the Arctic? Uh, come on, Shackleton. Shackleton, thank you, Shackleton. There's no reason to go to that ice block, you know. There's no reason yet. He did imperil the lives of all his men and saved them all because he wanted to. He wanted to prove a point. He had faith into some kind of belief um, that this is more important than any kind of you know, just normal rational impulse. So. I think that we're doing the space movement a disservice by constantly appealing to rationality. Now, while the entire engine of this entire venture is based upon the most meticulous application of rationality, you know, the machines we build have to be tuned to, you know, like this guy knows how to do it, I don't yet. <laughs> but like, you, know, you have to be that guy, you have to be that smart to know how to build these things, you know, but at the same time, what really kind of is going to push us forward is not going to be us saying, we can build these rockets that can get you know, cheaper, we can build these rockets that will save us from asteroids, we can build these rockets that will you know, jumpstart the economy. It, it, I, I believe that the only time we're going to get a space settlement movement, the only time we're actually going to be able to do something that is far beyond, um, far beyond those rational incentives is if we actually start to consider, see, see, and I'm going to get again a little, you know, for club, because this, this, this is a difficult subject for me to talk about, we have to actually st have to stop trying to sell space on mere rationality, and mere economics, and mere you know securities, you know military. It's strategy. cool because it's cool, and because we have to do it. Because why else are we here? Because you know it is evolution, it is life, it is everything that we're here for. You know the purpose of life is to beget more life in a more sophisticated manner. At least that's what I believe, and I believe that strongly enough to actually you know say that unequivocally. Purpose of Starting life. On the moon. Mm, yeah. Um, actually, said it was to beat the Russians. To beat the <laughs> Russians. <laughs> yeah. Want to beat the Russians? Yeah, but even still, like beating the Russians is, is a uh, that is a biological imperative. That is a genetic imperative. That's saying we are superior to this other group of organisms. You know, even though our differentiation between them is very, very limited, we're superior to them. So you know, it's, 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 it's the two tribes on the opposite sides of the yep. river in 2001, you yep. know, shaking bones yep. at each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of them started the coffee guys calling me. Hello. <laughs> You could just force yeah. everyone to read Arthur C. Clarke's first book. <laughs> What's that again? Just force everyone to read Arthur C. Clarke's book. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, to Downey Studios, uh, do, do you see the Columbia Memorial Space Center? I'm getting more coffee. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Memorial Space Center. It's, it's a big, kind of metal-looking, wavy building. Um, it's near Downey Studios. It's right by Downey Studios. It should have a big banner on it that says Space Up LA on it. White. It's a white building. That's a little parking lot. Yeah, and you should see it, and you should be able to basically see the big man who's based FLA and walk right in, and um, and there should be some people to take care of it, okay? All right. Yeah. Um, 
Scott, Simone, um, could you go manage a coffee situation? He's at the case, thank you. This, this, this is what managing conferences is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I'd like to point out is that, um, you know, different people need different messages, right? So if you're talking to those of us here today, the message of inspiration will get us to go, I mean, Philip Musk gave me a call. I'm in Dragon tomorrow. I got to tell you. Okay, it'll happen. But, and then probably half the people here would say the same thing, right? But um, you know, so there's a, you know the thing of the bell curve, right? And, and so you've got you've got those shackles, whatever, and then those crazy guys who will go follow them, whatever. They're at one end of the bell curve. That's just the way they are. That's their genetic, you know, whatever we're associated with. How, how are they ended up that way? Yeah. Well, but but the, let's let's not disparage the middle of the bell curve mm -hmm. that sustains everything else and provides us all the resources to go do the cool, interesting stuff that leads the way, right? So we can't be disparaging of that, but at the same time, we are going to have different messages for different groups of people. To, to, to get Germans on board, you just say Lieben's wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but, but like you know, so yes, the, the, that is a very practical point, and I think that that is a practical attitude that will, you know, continue things roughly in the direction that they've been going on. Um, what, what I'm kind of appealing for in this is kind of like a message in which we attempt to break beyond the kind of, you know, like, like, like right now, you know, our, our industry and our whole thing, like at least from my limited experience of it so far, is, is, is on a gradual upswing possibly coming to a punctuated, you know, epoch in which everything will be awesome. Um, you know, we're, we're moving, you know, like things are going better than they have, um, and uh, but at the same time, I, I think that we're never going to be able to. I don't think we're gonna have a hundred thousand people on Mars if we continue to be, in, if continue to only or continue to pr prefer the practical message and to basically shield the, the inspiration, the inspirational and, and art and more or less the Kool Aid, the article of faith from the public. I think basically what there needs to be is a narrative. There needs to be legends. There needs to be. A, a treatment of the subject much more like that, I'm going to use that R word, much more like a religion, as uncomfortable as I'd like to say it, but like it's kind of like, you know, basically, you know, what we're doing here is actually quite possibly one of the most important things in the history of life itself. It's and a, I, I think you're talking about the frontier philosophy. Yeah. That's probably the word you're looking for, which, yeah. which seems to be missing from the popular consciousness mm -hmm. to a yeah. large degree. Yeah. Because the, popu the populace mostly thinks that the frontiers have been conquered. Right. There's, there's not a recognition that it's in reach. I mean, I always start out any conversation space, just, you know, did you know that Europe, the Americas were six months away from Europe and Mars is six months away from us right now? We're at the same point right now in humanity. And we just need to start doing it. And, and that, that gets so many things going. And for most people, if they did cross that, that six month gap, they didn't go back again. What was the comparative cost? I mean, I'd love to know this. The, that's, that's you that's everything you own and you can afford it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, re the reason why this was seven years of indenturement, because it was about seven years of earning a living to pay it back. That was the rough figure. And that's what one of the things that Ellen and others are trying to do. Yeah, well, that's, that's what people are trying to get to, and that's why reducing the cost of yeah, launch has been so helpful. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's still not quite in that yeah. zone. And so, you know, the, the, but the more of it that happens, See, I have enormous faith that it's it's going to happen because it's happening. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, I think that there, as it happens, it'll snowball. And, I mean, you know, it took several hundred years for Europeans to do all the things they did and, and, and found where we're at now. And so, um, and actually, to discover that Chinese had actually done it, you know, three years before or something, right? And, and so, you know, it's not that European system. But the Chinese did a very interesting thing, and we're in a very similar position right now, in that the Chinese did an immense wave of exploration, and then they decided, well, forget it, and they burned their ships at harbor. Mm -hmm. Well, but there was, there was, we think that there were some, some economic and political reasons for that, and so what we need to do is lay the foundation so that those things don't come to fruition again, right? And I you think that we have... You don't want vested interests who don't want you to succeed. Right. Right. And, um, you know, fortunately, we are, we live in a world where information flows a lot more readily. And so the memes about the frontier are going to go, in, you know, if somebody actually succeeds, in, I mean, when Ellen or whoever finally gets some people on Mars here in the next decade, you know, it's going to be huge, guys. Yeah. And, 
it's, it's, I have no doubt whatsoever it's going to happen. Now, there's other people <coughs> not here today that maybe have doubts or you know, don't understand why. About 20 years ago, I was reading something about we'll know that we'll, we've really started to succeed when you get a Mars expedition that's paid for and organized by the National Geographic Society. Right. <laughs> when it becomes, when it gets down to the point where private organizations can, through public subscriptions, send off an exploratory expedition. The National Geographic Society in the late 19th and early 20th centuries did a lot of that. You know, actual full-blown exploration of places where there hadn't been boots on the ground before looking at stuff. And uh, it'd be really nice if we could return to that point where you get universities and private philanthropic organizations funding the exploration and exploitation follows close on the heels of that. Well, like, luckily, I mean, I've already seen direct results of that. Well, like, my, my father was, you know, one of the founding members of the Planetary Society, and they tried to put a microphone on Mars a couple of times. I think um, both times if they happen to pick the wrong Mars lander. Finding percentages were against them at the time. Yeah. But a Martian Google got them. Yeah, I imagine that their only sound sample they got sounded like a car crusher. Right, and that is when we truly, basically, we truly succeeded when people treat space travel with the same kind of glum dread that you treat commercial aviation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where you're like, oh crap, I gotta fly to, uh, to, to, to DC today. I need to fly 3,000 miles through the sky in a metal tube designed by the most brilliant people in my civilization. You're sitting in a Built chair in the sky. That was one of my favorite acts. Oh but right, but like, I mean, okay. But, I, you know, so so that's the end result, right? But, I mean, how do we get there? And, and how, how do we muster the forces of irrationality is really what I'm trying to say. Muster the forces, rather than, you know, saying, you know, okay, because look how much stuff that's going on that is utterly irrational. Look at this debt thing that just happened. I don't even know. I mean, like, it was just, what? Well, like, I mean, it was irrational. It was purely irrational. The oh. debt, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, like the whole, like, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the raise the debt ceiling, raise the debt ceiling thing, thing yeah. which, and, and there the were all these tied into the budget, that's why, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it was only, I mean, like, like the, the, you know, and, but, but that, 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 that an overly politicized example, but, you know, we all have our favorite pet examples of extreme rationality that causes enormous amounts of, you know, change, you know, and what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we are shockingly rational people that engage in a very rational world, and, you know, that's pop probably because, you know, our knives are sharpened on the whetstone of rationality. We can't do anything but be rational because all we do is work with things that will blow up if you screw up. Um, except, except, so there's, there's, a, there's a, a wonderful book out right now called The Happen Happiness Hypothesis. Um, and there's a very interesting metaphor that he has brought forward uh, from, I guess, the Buddha way back. When. But the point is this. As we understand our brains now, I think they say, you know, it's just, the forebrain just showed up in the past epoch of our evolution, right? And, and most of our evolution, we've got all these other parts of our brains that are doing things. And the the old Buddhist metaphor of it's a rider on an elephant. And it's all your old brain emotional parts that don't have language that are off doing their own thing. And the rider thinks it's in control. But the rider's only in control as long as the elephant wants the same thing that the rider wants. <laughs> the elephant wants to get laid, have food, or whatever, the elephant's going to go do that stuff, and then the rider will sit there and go, oh yeah, I wanted to go over there because, well, and you know, we all know we're, we're great yeah. at figuring out why we wanted to do something, but really there's this elephant that is actually a huge percentage of our decision making, right? We're trained to be rational and acknowledge the logic of things, but we're not really trained to respect the fact that a huge part of what drives us is our emotions. Right? And so, I mean, Clyde's point is, you know, stir up the emotions, I think, and it, it moves us along. It, 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 it'll energize the discussion. It'll create the stories. I mean, because it's, it's, that's the connection that we have. Yeah. Probably sustaining that, though. Like, right. sustaining an emotional response like that for a long period of time is very difficult, too. Well, and yeah. that's and that's and I think you saw that with the follow-up. Like, mm -hmm. we sustained it for a decade. Yeah. That was impressive. Yeah. 
and, and you know, and the forces that drove that were the team competitive thing, which is why I think you know, I, I have I don't know if anyone's actually doing it. It's hard to keep up nowadays, but there is it's it's accelerating. The curve is going right. Would Apollo have succeeded, flown, made the goals that it made if Kennedy hadn't been killed? How much of this was a nation that's greatest a, that's question? Question. That's, that's yeah. a great question. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so yeah. you know the 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 idea of I think that the next thing somebody needs to do on sorry or whatever they need to throw the the in situ resource whatever to return from Mars they need to just go throw that out there and say it's there boys go get it right yes, yes. or or some equivalent to that and, and, you know, the lunar equivalent to that or you know just just throw something out there and and so what's interesting to me is you know every time it's funny because I don't know if anybody's watching this stuff or whatever but I sort of didn't pay attention to space for about a decade or so because I was like you know Sucks. But now, <laughs> suddenly, I mean, I heard Elon Musk a year ago, and he says multiplanetary species, and it was like a major media thing, and nobody laughed. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, maybe it's finally here. You know, here's a yeah. guy, he's got money in his pocket, he's going to go do it, and he gets it, and he gets what we need to do, right? Um, so, and, you know, so here am I. I'm, I'm, a, I'm stirred up, right? I'm excited, and I'm sitting here running the thing while he's going off and doing whatever. Um, but, uh, so, we, we do need to involve our emotions in the process. Sustaining it, though, you know, you, you create the structure to sustain a something like that. That's for a room full of engineers. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you need the right answer. Well, that's possible. You know, this gets back. We, we, do, need, we do need the technical, <laughs> rational talent. We have to need that. You can't do that. It's impossible. <laughs> so, um, you know, things like competition, and this is, some, I know John Hickman has done some very interesting work. I can't remember where he's at. He's at one of the Carolinas, he's a professor out there. But he put a book together called Reopening the Space Frontier, and he points out a lot of the similarities between the European expansion of the 15th, 16th centuries and, and now, and, and some of the things that happened then, and why people who propose, oh, it's all going to be this way, it's all gonna, are, are kind of fooling themselves, because really we're going to need the competition aspect to stir us up. We're going to need the capitalists engaged because they think they're going to make money. A bunch of them are not. You know, a bunch of the people who started railroads did not make a bunch of money. Some did, right? Great. I'm keeping them going for a year. Thank you. Let's see if coffee people. See, yeah, but, that, that so point, sorry, right, but that point right there is that you want to stir the economy. You tell them, hey, we're going back. We're going to Mars. Boom. We're going back to the moon. It's better than any war. Right. <laughs> 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 the problem is, we're good at war. Or we know how to make war work. <laughs> And we know how to make the right people money in war. Right. Oh, right. And, and, we, right. and we need, yeah. And so, but so both of them involve building a whole lot of hardware and throwing it away. Not if you do our job right. But it's the emotional. It's the emotional thing, and, and people are tied to that emotion. So getting people into and hooking them with the emotion of, okay, guys, yeah, we really do know how to compete. So let's compete at something that we go out there instead of getting locked in here. Right. One thing which I'm really hoping will help is in the next few years when, when all the uh, suborbital space tourism companies start flying to people, mm -hmm. is that J random citizen will actually know somebody who's flown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, I met quite a few astronauts, but that's because of the industry I work in. Mm -hmm. And anybody else that doesn't work in that industry, astronaut too, that's somebody you see on TV. Mm -hmm. But if you get a chance, you know, that, that somebody that, you know, you went to high school with, you run into them at a reunion, and you say, yeah, I went for a space flight last year, it was so cool. <laughs> and then that's when it'll start to be, you know, that's where the last of the giggle factor will go yeah. away at that point. You know, it's interesting because uh, I think his name is John Spencer. He's kind of this, this entertainment guy. And, and i got to say, a lot of the, the whole let's go waste our time and the idle amusement it rubs me the wrong way, right? <laughs> but it actually engages the emotions of a lot of people, and so it's one of the ways I can see now it's actually going to be a hook for us to invest energy in this because it, it's going to shift our energetic direction from oh we're we're com we're battling here for limited resources to oh no wait we we need to battle to go get the resources that are out there and let's do the the, the race around the moon, the moon and all these other kind of things which. I don't watch Mother Cross, I don't care. Yeah, they can figure out, like, on that, on that um, you know, message of economics, you capture a small to medium uh, asteroid, and you mine that asteroid, 
those asteroids are worth like a trillion dollars. But no, but it's, 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 and we've all made those rational arguments. You know, take that same asteroid that's in a crash course of Earth and you blow it, you divert it with some kind of, some collection of technologies and you're a hero. Or you, you know, grow on to it and then you're, you're, ty you're a lunar tycoon or something, you know. But like, the, the thing is, those are again rational arguments. And those are again kind of saying, look at the benefits space can present to you in a very practical, meaningful way, in the sense of money in your pocket or, you know, like, those are food in your, food in your stomach. But, you know, again, you know, what I'm trying to say is, that how, you know, how can we tap into the the three people, you know, people doing things for non-practical reasons? Fucking in zero G. Tell me it hasn't happened yet. No, actually, yeah. Yeah, I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> A lot of the things that human beings do for rational reasons, they do for the same the reason of having that cozy spot where they can exist. In other words, how do we make space home? People will do anything for home, essentially. Even if you're the sort of person who leaves it, like I, I left Texas, my whole family's there, I don't want to go back. But I'd be extremely upset if something happened to that. I, you know, even if I don't want to live there, I'm happy there are people who do. How do we transfer that to space? Make space home, make people realize this is a place where even if they don't want to live there, that other people do, and that it's good to make this possible. Mm. 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 Interesting case, there was an astronaut who did a rotation on ISS uh, six or seven years ago. And um, she put her stuff into storage, uh, finished her lease on her apartment, and moved to space. She well, didn't keep a residence on Earth well, while she was on the space wow. station. You know, it's a whole different mindset where instead of being a temporary duty assignment, that's where you live for the next six months. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think she was the first person to actually do that, to relinquish her Earth-side abode and have the space station as her address. But we're still talking about we're still talking about four thousand dollar lunches at you know ten thousand dollars a pound dry. Yeah. You know, it's just it's the the you cost of, of moving what you need to survive from point A to point B, mm -hmm. you know. There just isn't anybody rich enough outside of a government entity at this point that can afford that. But if you start working towards getting the, those emotions in place, you'll have more and more people working on the problems, right. which will eventually get the launch cost down, hopefully. Well, but I, again, like, yes, you know, investing, you're you're investing in more than just yes. one rocket, right? right. right. Instead of investing in, uh, like, I love Masten, I love SpaceX, I love Boeing. I mean, invest in all these companies that want to do this stuff and instead of just say, well, you know, that one looks good, and invest in that money. I mean, it did, it's not rational to me. That's why I get all fired up. I'm like, look, 10 people. Pick what rocket does this and do it. it moves three people at a time up for $4,000 a pound? Right. One rocket can move a year's worth of supplies up at $10,000 a pound. But what, what is the story of that rocket? What is the legend? What is the reason of that rocket's existence? You know, like we're talking about pounds and dollars. You know. What is the meaning in the greater humanistic experience? Like, wow, I'm sounding really funny here, but you get the idea. Like, you know, like you know, when you look back through history, right? You know, the story, the history basically blurs out and blurs out, blurs out, and becomes myth eventually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so the furthest back reaches of history are basically indistinguishable, indistinguishable from myth or mythic in their sense. Um, and then you know, you have you have at least the way that you're you're taught it, you know, and whatever. Um, but you know, we're kind of right now at the very bleeding edge of our own present moment, therefore we're seeing everything very, very, you know, crystal clear vision. In 2,000 years, what is, you know, what is the role of Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin going to be in society in 2,000 years? How are the people that will be seen? How will the, you know, our march into space be perceived by our, you know, people in the future? Like, you know, what is its role in the in this, in the myth of that particular society. If you could society. travel back in time a thousand years, what's the question you'd want to ask Neil today? Yeah. Or, or what, I mean, from what, that perspective. What inspired Shackleton or Columbus or 
Miss Quincy or whoever, you know, all the names. Of what would Buzz Aldrin do? But you know, make sure the door swung the other way. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, those guys were, were certainly inspired by things beyond themselves, right? It wasn't just their own self-interest. Their so they'll show their self-interest and the possibility of grandiose self-aggrandizement and reward was there, right? You know, if you're the guy who finds the route to the West Indies, you're the guy, you know, it's okay. But I mean, if Queen Isabella's got a really big boat full of gold for you. Well, well, yes. And, and um, so, you know, there's that, but there's also all, the, there's the religious things that can make some people uncomfortable because it, it's, it gets you into where you're, you're part of some greater something. You're, you're rising above. Oh, you're participating in something that is greater than yourself, whether you call it the overall forces of evolutionary destiny, or whether you call it, you know, back in the 1800s or 1600s, you know, it was the will of God, or you called it that, but it probably felt the same way inside. It's just at the time you labeled it that way, and now we label it some other way. But it was still that emotional thing inside. But it's uh, let's be part of something bigger than ourselves. Well, I think I think when people see space as a way to improve their lot in life then that's when you're going to get the maximum amount of, of interest in it. Because really, ultimately, I think self-interest is, is the most powerful force. If I think that I'm going to be more wealthy by doing something in space or going to space, or my life is going to be better, I'm going to make my existence uh, something more fulfilling, uh, then it becomes an obvious choice, not just something for far-off thinkers. I mean, in some way, everybody who is at risk in old space right now is an advocate of new space. Whether they know it or not, whether they realize it or not. Explain that what we have got to They're all they're all at risk of being laid off, downsized, whatever, and right. and uh, you know, so gee, where where, where their self interest of feeding their face, where where are they gonna go? Well, you know, the new guys. Two two weeks ago, give or take, the Russian news agency announced that they that they planned to the orbit the space station in 2020. That was a garbled That was, yes. yeah. Yeah. That, that, that was not that what was, yeah. Okay, I, I figured that was the case, but it, but it never got retranslated. Yeah. There are more than one country that gets a go on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, then, uh, well, yeah. well, the Russian guy won the like, keyboard press and that thing pack. One hammer. One hammer. One hammer.